Our featured BBB Wise Giving Alliance accredited charity seal holders for this episode are Holt International, ICNA Relief USA, Jacinto COVID World Organization. To find out more about these and other BBB Wise Giving Alliance accredited charity seal holders, go to give.org. <music> You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBgive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. This is the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBgive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator, and it's your one-stop source for information on giving and reports in the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor. This week, we are visiting again after a couple of years with my friend, Dr. Aaron Bass, who is the CEO of Eastside Charter in Wilmington, Delaware. And Aaron has spent much of his career trying to educate disadvantaged young people so that they could grow up and be prosperous in life and have a better chance at success. And we visited with him about a couple of years ago when he was telling us all about the great work going on there. So I thought it was great to check in with him again, just to see what kind of progress he's made since we last talked. Aaron has an unwavering commitment to expanding opportunities for disadvantaged students. And this kind of took root for him as a teenager when he was attending the Million Man March in 1996. And that sparked his passion for educational equity. And after graduating from our alma mater, Franklin and Marshall College, he joined Teach for America in Atlanta before returning to his hometown, Philadelphia, to help launch the Kip Du Bois Collegiate Academy. And during his tenure there as the CEO and principal, that school quickly emerged as one of the highest performing Kip high schools in the country. But since 2017, he's been at Eastside Charter, and he's been able to defy many of the expectations of what's possible for students in that area. And Eastside's middle school now outperforms the state average in every test subject. And its Apex Honors Program is propelling students to earn scholarships at top private high school. So Aaron, listen, I I could go on and on about the great work you're doing, but I just want to welcome you back to the show. And thanks for being here. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I appreciate the introduction. While I, I can say those are wonderful accolades, our growth is amongst the highest in the state of Delaware on our assessments, but we're still looking to increase our overall outcomes. And how are you going about that? What are some of the areas that are concerning you and how are you going about addressing them? Well, I, I think that delves into the, the current STEM hub that we're building. And we started looking at how to solve the issues, not just of the students, but of the entire community. Uh, we've done that for some time here at Eastside, even predating me being here. Within Eastside, uh, we are in one of the high poverty, high needs environment, which also I think has the highest amount of uh, opportunity for growth. And so we realize that if we're going to try to address the issues of poverty with young people, then we need to figure out how to address the issues of poverty with adults. So we decided, well, first, if that is our problem statement, that we need to address the issues of poverty, and that only can be done by bettering careers of the adults and the students' lives, then we looked at what is the number one career industry in the state of Delaware. It's STEM. 
If you think about the history of uh, chemistry and technology here in the state of Delaware, everything from the DuPonts to Gore to a number of other uh, organizations, even our state employer with Christiana Hospital being one of the largest employers here in the state, then we need to make sure that people who are in our community have access to those careers. So we had a very big and bold idea that we thought was at the time four to eight million dollars it ballooned to $26 million, which we fundraised in two years, going from raising $300,000 a year to almost a million dollars a month. The idea was let's get our corporate partners to partner with us and invest in uh, workforce development based here at the Eastside Charter School that is open to the public. What's unique about Eastside is and about this project is this is not meant to be A school building, it's actually being used during the school day for students, but during the afternoons, uh, evenings, and weekends, it's run by the Wilmington Public Library. And our corporate partners come in, our nonprofit partners come in, and they are able to train adults. And by doing that, the idea is over a four-week, six-week, three-month period, even some of the partnerships uh, lasting for training as much as a year, then adults can go from making, let's say, $20,000 a year uh, to making sixty dollars to $80,000 a year with some of our partners and no uh, college degree is needed. If we're able to provide better opportunities for the families of those that we're serving, then that means that the young person who is six years old is able to have a better life because their family is able to access better opportunities. And it's not just for parents. It is for literally everyone in the community. You know, Aaron, I have to tell you, I've lived, I guess, long enough to see things return (laughs) that we used to do. And when I was in elementary school, the middle school in our neighborhood in South Philadelphia was called Bartlett Middle School, Bartlett Junior High, was open at night. This is in the 1960s. So from six to nine, You could come into the school. You could learn how to do wood shop, metal shop. You could do something if you wanted to work in a gym. There were things for us to do, play play in a band, learn how to play an instrument. You could go into the school at night so that there were things for us to do instead of sit home and watch TV or something worse. And we got value out of that. And then, you know, it stopped. I mean, I guess after people lost faith in the war on poverty, which I guess a lot of that money came to to fund from the war on poverty, it kind of went away. But I always wondered why we didn't do more with our school facilities, you know, over the years. These are amazing places where people can gather to do things. And it just seems to me that you've picked up on that. And have now not only done what we used to do, but taking it to a whole nother level. When you're talking about increasing a person's livelihood from twenty thousand to sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year, and you're not only using young people, you're using you're giving older people, adults, an opportunity to improve their lives by using these facilities. That's amazing to me. And it just makes so much sense, though. What is what is it that keeps these kinds of programs from expanding, not only in Delaware, but around the country? I could say a number of things, one being the capacity of schools to address these issues uh, in silos. And so I think a lot of times we look at specifically K-12 education to solve the issues on their own, as opposed to Something very simple, if you want to prepare a young person to become an engineer or become a a doctor, a lawyer, or be head of BBB, it's a great idea. But if that child never sees anyone that's doing that career and or that looks like them in that same career, then it is as simple as uh, it's as easy as comparing that to going to the moon or going to Mars. So I think one, the access to making sure there are partners in this work. One of the benefits of how we approach this was not to tax our teachers, but to look at how can we create viable training centers for our corporate partners and our nonprofit partners. 
So we have everything from Camores, Barclays, University of Delaware, NASA, coding programs like Code Differently, Future First Gaming, Westside Health, and the list goes on that are working with, with this project. And they're running their independent programs here. One major difference for us is acknowledging it's not just about job opportunities for the adults. We also have to address mental health. So one thing we added on to this project was in the same building that you can get workforce development training and job opportunities, then we're also going to have psychiatrists and psychologists on site that will be offering therapy to anyone in the public. It is very, I would say, limited for us to believe that a person does not have a successful or financially viable career only because they didn't read the right book. So if somebody's been out of employment that would be successful for them or viable for them, are there other issues of trauma that have impacted them? Are there other issues in the community? We have seen children come to school as young as five, six, and seven years old having experienced a horrible traumatic incident the night before. While we have therapists that work in our own building and counselors, that six-year-old might be going back into an environment where the adults that just experienced the trauma haven't even had the chance to process or grieve because they're working 10, 15 longer days and they're constantly having to adjust and not realizing the impact the trauma's had on the adults which then leads to more chaos. And that child might have left therapy session with us, but goes back into chaos. So having something available for the entire family, we picture a world that you could have an an aunt and uncle come in, both be in counseling sessions. You have a father or a mother come in and they're in workforce development. And then you also have the child that's there that's learning either how to be an engineer, learning about coding, or even doing some of our gaming projects where they get a chance to actually be an esports gamer, which is also a viable career. But then if they want to get into the mechanics behind that, such as the coding that goes into making those games or, or even into some of the sports science behind some stuff they're doing, then that's available as well. The key for us is that if our community is in a more positive environment, then our young people can be in a much more positive environment. And the data shows that higher economic incomes levels have higher outcomes for children as far as their achievement on assessments. There's nothing to do with the children. It has everything to do with the environment. And so how are we then trying to figure out how to solve some of those gaps? So let me go back, Aaron. You mentioned that you raised a million dollars a month, is it? Yeah, we're doing a million dollars a month for two years. million dollars a month to make this work. Where is this money coming from? Good question. It's interesting. So the, while our average is about a million dollars per month, yeah. it was uh, it came in tranches. So we received uh, support from Comores at $4 million for uh, the initial investment in this STEM hub. That's why it's called the Comores STEM hub here at Eastside Charter School. We received a million dollars from Barclays, who saw the benefit of this project for Eastside, our surrounding community, but also for Barclays. We're excited about that. Our state has invested $7 million into this project. Our federal delegation invested $3 million. And so that is from Senator Coons and Senator Carper uh, that invested that. We've also received funding from foundations here in Delaware, as well as from Department of Education receiving another $5 million. And part of the $5 million was on top of the workforce development and access to STEM and the mental health, we also want to have a student-based health center in this building. So we have a partner, uh, Westside Health, which is a medical uh, partner, and they'll be providing medical services to students here in the same building. Fantastic. So how did you go about organizing the various service providers to participate? Interesting. We just found ourselves in conversation. And I could say the beginning of a capital campaign, it was interesting trying to get somebody to bite. Mm -hmm. And so so I've learned the hardest part of a capital campaign was the first large donation. And then also the last donations needed. So that was success begat more success we kept finding ourselves in more rooms of people that were also trying to figure out some of the same issues that that caught wind of this project and jumped on board. We're excited about our partners because I can say that every partner that we have was excited not only for jumping onto this project, but also working and collaborating with each other. 
which builds more synergy. And now it's time for our giving tips segment with Bennett Weiner, one of the world's most renowned experts on charity accountability and the COO of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance. Today, I'd like to talk about charity websites. It's generally the first place people think of going when they want to find out more information about an organization. Of course, we hope you'll go to give.org to see if we've evaluated them in relation to our standards and have a report. But if you visit a charity's website, I want to mention four things that you should look for to see if they're present. And that will help demonstrate their transparency. First thing is, is there some type of a brief statement of what the organization's mission is? What is it seeking to accomplish? This should be a sentence or maybe a paragraph or maybe a website page that describes that, but it should be visible and accessible to you. The other thing to look for is some summary of the recent achievements, what they've done in the past year. It shouldn't be too hard to find that because most charities are going to want to bring attention to their accomplishments, and that's also an incentive to give to them. So that should probably be up front, and you'll be easy to find them and read about them. The third thing I'd say is finances. Do they have a copy of their IRS Form 990, which is annually filed with the IRS, and or their audited financial statements online? Now, financial statements shouldn't be the only thing that you look at. Definitely not. It's just one consideration. But the availability of information, such as the latest 990 filing, is something that we look for in charity websites, and you should look for it too. The fourth thing I would say also to keep in mind is, is there a board roster available? The governing board of the charity is really who's in charge of their oversight and activities. Don't just look at the names on the roster, but also see if they identify the professional affiliations of those board members. That can give you some confidence in terms of the nature of their expertise. Do they have the types of backgrounds that you would anticipate or hope for to help run that organization? So those four things, a mission statement, a summary of recent achievements, finances, and a board roster are important issues to look for when you visit a charity with website. Well, I also appreciate that you're using a multidisciplinary approach to addressing what started out as the problems of kids. You know, and you, you basically have said we can't deal with the kids effectively until we're dealing with their environment, which includes their parents and and others, right? So we need to get the parents straight while we're getting the kids straight. And by the way, getting them straight doesn't just mean educating them because there are things that have to be done before we can even effectively educate them, deal with trauma, deal with things that may or may not be going on effectively at home and in their environment. So there are probably people out there, Aaron, who would say, you know what, a teacher's job, a school's job is to teach the kids. All this other stuff is not really important. Let somebody else worry about that. I'm glad to see that you have taken a broader approach, but how do you deal with the critics who say that school is supposed to be here to educate? It's not supposed to be feeding people. It's not supposed to be dealing with mental illnesses. It's not supposed to be a hospital. It's not supposed to be all of that that you're doing. It's not supposed to be a job training place for the parents. How are we dealing with that? How do you, what's your argument for that? I 100% agree with that argument. 110% agree with that argument. If I agree with that argument, then the follow-up is, if not us, then who? So if that is the case, then please show me, for example, in Delaware, part of our conversation was, if STEM's the number one driver of our economy here in the state, even the fact that we have 0% sales tax deals with mathematics and with banking, then show me the access point for anybody in Delaware all of the citizens to access this incredible opportunity in STEM. There are none. Wow. We also know that uh, 80% of those in the highest economic quintile, 80% of those graduate from college across America. You can pick any location, any state you want. 80% will graduate from college if they're in the highest economic quintile. If you're in the lowest economic quintile, your college graduation rate is 10% or lower. 
So if you tell me that people with means are graduating from college at 80%, but people without means are not graduating at 90%, then you have to explain, well, why is that the case? If you happen to be in higher economic situations, it's because you have access to lawyers and doctors and you have access to bankers and, and others in uh, incredible careers that also the finances to back that up. If you're in the lowest quintile, who you have access to? Mostly service industry. So if we want to make sure that there's a level playing field, I agree with you. Schools and teachers should be focused on delivering education to young people that they can use to uh, create the next uh, level of society. Then tell me how you address the needs of the child that has nothing. And that's the thing. I, I, I believe that we have to look at the opportunities that some children have that others don't. And when you don't have those opportunities, you have to create them. And that's what you're, that's what you're doing. And that's the difference. So if you're in a, in a school district where every kid has access to the kinds of things that you are expressing outside of school, then you don't need to put it in the school. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, then you have to put it somewhere. And if it's not outside of the schools for the kids to access and just use the school. So I, I'm completely with you on that. One more thing to add in is interesting about us is, is the level of trust in Eastside. So I can say for Eastside Charter, we did not know our full level of trust in the community until we had a, uh, the pandemic. Yeah. And our state and our uh, county were doing testing in the, we're in 19802. So that's our zip code here. And they were testing in different areas of this, this small area, and they were testing 10 to 30 people at a time. COVID testing, where they might have people testing literally all day long, eight hours a day, and they might come up with 30 people. The same COVID testing site was brought to Eastside. We did it in our parking lot. At the height of the pandemic, we were testing up to 1,000 people in three hours. Nothing could change but the location. Not the marketing, not the advertising, not even the people that were doing the testing. People started asking us, well, how is it that you went from 30 people a few blocks away to a thousand people in just three hours? And what we learned was that it was the level of trust that our public had in us, especially when institutions, be it in health or in other areas, aren't always trusted. It was the trust that people had in us, which then led us to think, well, if we have this level of trust, then how do we leverage this to impact our community in a better way? The pandemic is ending. And so we moved into the STEM hub program. But I also like the fact that we have people who are partnering with us that also have caught the vision. And we are based in a community of uh, Riverside where there's a larger project called Reach Riverside, where they are investing $600 million in this surrounding area into housing, into community health and wellness, and into bettering the community. Because it's not just if Eastside does this project, will it be successful? But do children and families have access to homes where they feel valued when they walk in? Is there access to community health and wellness where people can get engaged in healthy activities? So everything from nutrition to, to athletics to working out and things like that. Do they have access, not just at Eastside, but to the larger public in providing medical wellness to people? So there's a larger project that we're in, which is very interesting, where our contribution is adding mental health as well as workforce development to something that is very impressive taking place in our surrounding area. Wow. So you're you're doing something that not many people would even attempt. You're doing something that not many people would attempt. And I guess my question for you on that is, where does your motivation come from? to even try this? And then where does the drive come to see it through and actually succeed? Because you talked about, you know, getting the biggest, getting the first grant is the thing and then finishing it is also the thing. How do you wake up every morning thinking, I'm going to, we're going to get this done. Where does that come from? How do you advise others who are in similar situations to pursue something so broad and grand. That, that's a profound question. 
That's the ultimate question. Yeah, I, I think a couple things. So one, it helps that I am a parent of a child at Eastside. I was a parent of two. My son graduated from Eastside Charters in high school right now and just earned a job as a graphic design artist for a construction company. He's in high school, uh, so we're, we're excited about that. But having children that have gone to or go to this school, it means that, and I'm not the only one, there are many of our staff that have their children at this building. It started off when I got here, there might have been, there was one person with a child that went here, and now we have the majority of staff with children have their children either gone through the school or have graduated from the school, which I think is a, a huge testament to a wonderful community. All that to say, our decision making is not about those children or that community. It is actually my own community. So I think that matters a lot in your decision making. How much skin do you have in the game? I think, two, I am the children that I work with. I grew up in similar situations in West Philly and in Germantown. I had a single parent household where my mother was consistently working and I was either left to join programs or left alone. And my mother did the best that she could. And so I was able to take advantage of some great opportunities, but that's not always the case. So can we provide better opportunities and also engage people uh, and then also make sure that uh, do parents have to struggle? No, can we provide better resources because if my mother were able to make more money, then she wouldn't have had to take a second or even more of the jobs to make sure my brother and I were cared for. And then I think it's just on top of that, I think it's divine to have a vision and also uh, that God blesses you with something that uh, is greater than what you're doing, to have something audacious and then also have the courage to say, yes, we're going to do this. We were told no a lot and we continue pressing forward. And that's it's a larger team than just me. And we knew we had something that was viable and our being told yes just that one time made us keep moving forward. When we had gaps of 26 million, got the first 4 million in, great. Now we need to find out the 22. Let's learn about new market tax credits. Let's learn about other ways to approach the state, continue to develop and grow. But we just kept talking with people uh, who also believed, and it's, as many people can catch that vision matters. And I, I would say the last thing is that money follows vision. Vision never follows money. And I, I have seen that for me and for other people and so we spent less time focusing on the money and more time focused on the vision, building the partnerships, which then begat other money after. Well, you must know a lot of people in Delaware in order for you to even get meetings, because, I mean, honestly, you, you're running a major school system, I want to call it, in Delaware through your charter program, charter school. But how do you connect with businesses? How do you connect with foundations? How do you connect with corporations that are wanting to do things? How do you connect with politicians? I mean, you're trying to run a school. You got to do all that, too. I could easily see people saying, you know what? My job is to just educate these kids, make sure we got good staff. The staff is trained. And you're doing all of that on top of raising this kind of money, on top of having this kind of vision. And I understand what you're saying about your kids. You want to give them the best opportunity and being a parent that has kids going to the school, you want to make sure your kids are doing great. But I'm going to tell you, man, this is what you're doing is way above and beyond. And I, what I want to do is make sure that the nation is seeing this because we need more of these. We need to deal with this nationwide. You know, I, I say that in my mind, there are like four areas, four, three or four areas that I believe is hard to deal with in America. Number one is gun control. People just don't want to deal with that for whatever reason. Two is immigration reform. It's hard to even know what immigration reform looks like. Third is probably money and politics. It's hard to get money out of politics. And fourth is education. <laughs> and it's not that we can't fix education. It's to me, sometimes it just seems that we don't have the will. But you have that will. And I know that there are others out there that have the will. And I, I hope that they can see what you've done here. 
and maybe be motivated to try to take similar actions in their own towns or for people who have stalled in their efforts to get back up there and keep pushing forward to try to make this happen for not only the kids, but for the families in those communities. So when I listen to you talk about all of the wonderful things you're doing, I see you as a beacon for other efforts that need to take place or maybe are taking place around this country. You're in one of the smallest states with a high degree of poverty. You're not going to get a whole lot of attention from people, but you've capitalized on almost everything that you could and you didn't let no stop you. I I could just go on and on and talk, talking about how impressed I am with what you've done here. And look, let me just give you this last question in 10 years. What do you hope to see as a result of your efforts? Well, I want to say thank you for your thoughts and reflections. And it's, it's truly a team effort to answer your question in 10 years. This is interesting. So we continue to try to address the same issues of what else does our community need to improve? That's everything from APEX, which is our honors program. We realized that our high performing students were not uh, staying in independent high schools and or magnet high schools. What are they missing? We found a lot of the soft skills and also being able to connect in those environments with students that are as advanced as they are and also motivated. So we've seen that our students are doing better. That was the creation of our Apex Honors Program. The STEM Hub is an example of how we're trying to solve the issues of poverty and also access for our community in STEM and in job opportunities and, and mental health. In 10 years from the day, I don't think this will be the, the, the thing that solves it all. So I know that as we continue to try to wrestle with this larger concept of what is impacting our community outside of school that's impacting our, our, our young people, we're still going to be wrestling with that idea in the future. 10 years from the day, I, I hope that we see many of our families are doing much better in their careers and have access to better opportunities. Because of the results of that, I also expect to see that there are people who are coming back to lead in job training and also job opportunities. So recruiting people in our own community. We've already seen that take place and we look forward to that continuing on even greater than we're building the STEM hub. And I do think we're going to try to figure out, well, what else is needed for the STEM hub? I hope to replicate this in other areas. It's, it's not just a novel idea for Delaware. I think it can be used anywhere. And we'd love to work with partners on our strategy behind the STEM hub, as well as building the partnerships and also funding behind that, because I do think that every city and state needs it, especially when we're looking at high areas of poverty, which is not just in the urban areas, but also rural areas. So how do we make sure we're expanding opportunity in those places? And I think it's also big for us to be a part of a conversation where we stop only focusing on the teachers in schools to solve the issues that are largely impacting our society. We keep replicating the same society because we're focusing on just a a small number of people that have the smallest impact as far as a student's success. When we should be looking at entire society as a whole. So hopefully 10 years from the day, we're moving forward with new ideas, engaging our public in a larger discourse around K-12 education, as well as seeing people be successful as a result of this work. Well, look, I wish you all success and I'll be praying for you, cheering for you. If there's anything I can do, I'll be trying to help you. But you are amazing and I just can't get enough of you. I really can't. Appreciate you too, sir. Thank you for what you're doing for these kids, man. And listen, for all of you, who don't know, I I encourage you to go to the website. What is it? Eastsidecharter.org? Yeah. Is that what East, it is? Eastsidecharterschool.org. Uh, you can okay. learn more about our school as well as the STEM Hub, which is scheduled to open January 2025. And for all of you who are in the education space and looking for opportunities to improve your educational situation, you should study what this guy is doing, what this man is doing. And talk to him about how you can expand or create something in your own neighborhood, in your own communities. 
For all of you who are listening to the show for the first time, this is the Heart of Giving podcast, and you've been listening to Dr. Aaron Bass. I'm Art Taylor, the host of the show. If you're listening for the first time, you can subscribe to the show on all major podcast platforms, and I hope you do. And if you want to support the show, you can do that by going to give.org. The show comes out with a new episode every Tuesday, and I hope we'll see you back here next week. Thanks for listening. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.